Hi, my name is Christian Henson, and other than my work with Spitfire Audio, I also moonlight as a film, TV and games composer. I've been doing that for nearly 20 years and have written a whole bunch of orchestral scores, but there is a catch. I don't really understand music theory. I can't read music very well, and I didn't study it at college. So anyway, my first orchestral efforts happened when I was about 29, and I'd say I was cutting a lot of orchestral scores by my late 30s. I'm now 44, and if I think about it, I got my first synth, which was a Casio CZ1000, when I was 14. So when writing for strings, here's a brief summary of what I've learned over the last 30 years. So what is a string band or ensemble? Well, the most famous setup, I guess, is a quartet, where seated left to right in front of you is the first violin, the second violin, which is exactly the same instrument, by the way, a viola and a cello. For a string quintet, add a bass, and that's a full string ensemble. Add any number of strings, and the setup doesn't change. Whether it's five or 50 players, just think of them as five voices, known as sections, who each play, most of the time, just one note at a time. The highest notes are played by the first violins, then down through second violins, violas, cellos and basses. They can all play high and all of them can go fairly low, but you kind of need to keep them in that pitch hierarchy. Observe this convention and your programming will take its first step to sounding truly realistic because that is what our ears are used to hearing. So in this first module we're going to be writing and programming chamber strings. Quick translation, symphonic big, chamber small. To be honest I find the, the word chamber a bit daunting. Uh, this probably comes from the fact that if someone were to ask me to attend a chamber recital I'd usually make a polite excuse like I can't that night because I'm going to cover myself in vinegar and roll around in a bath of broken glass. To me, chamber music speaks of white wigs and harpsichords, but the actual modern understanding of the word is just for a small to medium-sized band of orchestral players. Not any particular style of music, it could be three clarinets and a cello playing some American systems music, or it could be a larger band of strings and woodwinds playing, say, Dario Marianelli's excellent Oscar-winning score Atonement, written for and played originally by the London Chamber Orchestra. For me, it's any number of orchestral players up to about eight first violins, anything bigger than that, and I think you could call it a symphony-sized ensemble. A uh, typical chamber strings ensemble would usually be six, five, four, four, two, or 21 players. A standard symphonic band would be 16, 14, 12, 10, eight. String sections tend to be top heavy, i.e. you get more violins than cellos usually, so you can create a rich sound. Uh, where the lower players already have that richness inherent in the instrument or range that it plays in. Just because we say small doesn't mean it sounds small. It just relates to the number of players. Uh, you just have to work a little bit harder, be a bit more creative, dare I say it, write better music to make it soar. That's why I think the word chamber has a slightly intellectual air, with writing music for quartets probably earning you the most snob air miles. Today I'm using an older library called Sable, which has now been superseded by Spitfire Chamber Strings, which are exactly the same samples, but Spitfire Chamber Strings is even easier to use. This library I helped to conceptualise after writing dozens of low-budget films and TV. I'd worked out over about a decade what is the lowest number of strings that sound like a real string orchestra and can make nice sounds easily. For me this is four firsts, three seconds, three violas, three cellos and three basses. It is agreed by most string players too that the most difficult number of strings to blend is two and I found that when you have two players they sound like two players, three they sound like an actual section. There's also something quite nice about this number um, being a bit unbalanced in the bottom end, something quite cinematic about there being a really rich cello and bass offering. Strings sing like voices and historically string music harmony, basically chords and the way that they're arranged or voiced stems from choral arranging. I believe a guy called Bach pretty much set out the stool for truly brilliant choral arranging, but you don't need to study this. Provided you think of a string band as a set of five voices and not a synthy string patch, you'll be halfway there. A small chamber band is nimble and expressive. You can't use size or scale to impress. You have to use the cully in a wholly more intelligent way. It's not like standing at the foot of your lover's balcony screaming, I love you. It's about staying up till the early hours of the morning writing a finely crafted poem. And it's not just about the quality of the paper and ink. You've got to get the words right too. So in a roundabout way, you're going to have to bear with me. Chamber arrangements just take that little bit longer. I'm going to try and write a piece that encompasses all of these ideas, starting from a sketch to something presentable as a strings idea. When I say sketch, I mean exactly that. I always consider programming strings as akin to an oil painting, where you start with either a charcoal outline or a quick colour wash, and you slowly apply each layer, bringing the picture more and more into focus. So other than a set of awesome samples, uh, what else do you need to make uh, some realistic string programmed stuff? 
Um, well, you need a computer uh, to load them into, and you need a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation. Um, I'm using Logic. You, you've seen me set up this demo uh, in little clips. Um, so you first need to load in an instance of a sampler, which for Spitfire is, uh, we use Native Instruments' brilliant uh, contact sampler. Uh, this is the kind of the, the engine of the plugin, if you wish, where Spitfire just makes content for a plugin. We're not, we're not uh, a software manufacturer, if you will, so we have to use a third party. So we go track, new tracks, software instrument, Stick that to the top so you don't get confused. And then down to instrument, contact. You only really need to do this once and then you can just duplicate tracks, stereo. So there's your rather daunting empty shell. And uh, with this sable or replaced by chamber strings uh, library, uh, you just pull these in. Before we get to playing it, uh, I think it's important to uh, also talk about the peripherals that you need. You need uh, some form of controller. Um, a nice 88 note weighted keyboard is uh, fantastic if you can get one of those. Um, if your keyboard like mine uh, doesn't have any more than uh, two faders, uh, then you'll need to get uh, an essential piece of kit, a uh, some kind of fader controller. Uh, the reason for this is there are several different ways of creating realistic dynamics and expression. Um, and two doesn't really cut it. Uh, another warning is uh, you can't really do this with knobs. Uh, you often need to control more than one at the same time. The way I've got this set up, it's an utter piece of, it's not a flash piece of kit at all, it's a piece of crap, Behringer. But I like the resistance and I like that it's real faders. Uh, you do get uh, iPad versions of, of this stuff, but it's, uh, I need to know where I am from kind of zero to 127 or zero to 100%. Um, so the way I've got it set up is expression, which is kind of like volume, but it isn't uh, volume. If I, I've actually got volume in on this one. If you see, if I push that, you'll see that's actually controlling the master volume. Now this you should really use for little tweaks and mixes. Uh, expression, which you'll see moving up and down, it's exactly the same thing as volume, but you can, it's volume within the volume. So uh, let's have a, I'll show you a little example. And if I turn the volume up, so you're working, you're changing volume within the volume. So it's kind of like a trim really. The second controller I use is uh, modulation, which would have been on the modulation wheel, but again, I need to wiggle more things at the same time. So I've uh, patched it to here. Uh, modulation often, certainly with longs, will modulate or crossfade between different recordings and uh, usually between soft and loud uh, performances. So you'll hear that that's not just turning it up and down, that actually the timbre or colour is changing. As I said before, I've got volume, which I use to mix. And finally, uh, I use uh, my fourth fader for vibrato, which if you imagine it with a voice, is the kind of wobble that all strings play with. So these four controllers control your entire dynamic repertoire, if you will. Uh, the final piece of the puzzle is if we go back into the interface, um, are the different articulations. And I don't know, the best way of describing this is it's almost different vowel sounds. So this long is a normal and just a standard. And this is muted. This is playing close to the bridge. This is playing over the ridge. It's like this is playing over the neck. Then we also have things like short. Plucked pizzicato. So what's great about this is it means you can actually switch between different articulations or vowels or shorts and longs plucked and, and muted. Um, on the same track. Uh, you can do this by physically programming the, the switches in, or if you see these key switches down here, you can actually use your keyboard to switch between them. 
I'm a little bit old school. And what that means is, I'm going to get rid of that, is I've simply loaded a different articulation long. pizzicato per channel. You'll also see I've got some colored blue and some colored green. Um, the blue ones refer to a, an ensemble patch, which basically means we've mixed the different sections, if you recall me talking about the different voices. So it's across the entire keyboard, which for me, you know, when you're writing, I like to use both hands. And referring back to composing as, as an oil painting, uh, these are my colour washes, my sketching tools, and then I go into the individual sections, first violins, uh, seconds, violas, etc, etc, to provide um, detail, focus. And these are often legato patches, which are monophonic, i.e. you can only play one note at a time. But they're the most articulate of... Uh, articulations you'll get and what you need to do in order to make them work is actually make sure that the notes join up as opposed to it's still effective for a different effect if you want them to feel really lyrical then you join them up So by using these uh, different styles of articulations, um, I'm going to demonstrate writing with two different methods. Um, the way I usually write is block chords or at least one hand, mapping everything out like it was a keyboard part. The other way, which I find a lot more difficult because I'm not uh, theoretically trained, so I, it's very much in the moment, and if I walk out of the room to make a cup of tea, I've forgotten about it, is to physically work each voice, each part up, being aware of where each part is relative to the other. I'm going to write a piece that uses one method, the other method, and also mixes them up as well. So I'm going to start the first part using my favourite sound of all time, the Spitfire Chamber Strings Flautando Patch, which is an Italian word which basically means fluty, and uh, it's where the players play very softly, a little bit further away from the bridge, and it produces a flute-like tone. This has a soft choral quality, as I mentioned. The trick with strings with writing is if it feels good with the choir, then it'll sound excellent at strings. So this is a lovely mixture of the two almost. There's also a fragility in the sound that matches how I always feel when starting to write a piece of music, especially when I know I'm being watched doing it. So here's the first bit of writing, just with my right hand. I'm going to remember that this is a small band, so I'm going to limit the first pass to just three notes at a time. You would have noticed that I'm constantly moving my left fingers on my controller, even if the part is fairly static. When you see string players perform, there is so much movement. The bows, the fingers, not only playing the note, but the vibrato, and then they'll be moving side to side, rocking back, backwards and forwards. So always keep movement in there, even if you want it to sound still. Imagine painting a portrait of a small child. You want them to sit still and behave, but you don't want them to stop breathing. So as I've done here, it sounds static, but it sounds alive. So I've just copied that over and I'm now going to transpose that down uh, an octave just to give it a bit of a variety. And next up, bass. last note so let's just have another go at that
A lot more tender. Um, next up is cello, um, which I'm going to actually try and put in between the bass and the other strings. in the moment so I have to go if I'm happy with it just let's chop that up and then I'll move to the next bit because I'll forget what I've done otherwise and uh, so let's just shift that up there and let's work on the next bit first bit done let's move along to the next bit I'm gonna actually speed it up a bit and often find if you use a curve um, it has a more natural sound but it's, it's quite a considerable accelerando as they call it these colinos hitting the back of the hitting the strings with the back of the bow and for short articulations the volume is dependent on how loud you physically hit the keyboard Duplicated that. Some very soft, muted shorts. Okay, I wasn't actually recording, so I'm going to have another go at that. Excellent. Right, I'm going to quantize that ever so slightly, not too heavily. Loop those colonias. Always good to play everything in, it gives it a much more natural flavour. Just a little correction here. Bass pizzicato. line but in the cello and I'm going to use a legato for this. Just 
just fixing the quantize there on the column. Okay, yes. Here we go. to the third bit and what I'm going to do is actually just transpose the basses down because I want to record the basses and cellos at the same time um, and I find this is easy for orchestrators if you actually write it at the pitch it's written so it, it plays a pitch an octave lower than the pitch written um, and this is a very common or or orchestration technique of having the cellos and basses play an octave apart <laughs> I really don't like that, so I'm going to fix those. second violin so let's have a look at those see these aren't preserving that higher an Everest hierarchy we depicted earlier so just correcting these harmonic points so the second violins are still underneath the still underneath the firsts. Let's go to nosebleed time now, I think. <clears throat> Let's take this up.
So this will overlap that note. Let's just have a quick listen to that. And they're on separate tracks, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Viola Park going in. into the console, you know, so let's start fleshing this out a bit. I'm going to take these flautandos, and I'm going to copy them into the harmonics, and then transpose the harmonics upper an octave. So essentially they'll be playing an octave lower in real terms, but uh, there we go. Lovely ethereal tone there. Expression automation down so it mixes in just a little bit more, it's not too much of a feature. out with some more standard style articulations but I'm going to reprogram the uh, automation um, so we can really give it a sense of shape over the entire bit of the piece so using the same notes but re-recording the automation starts to flesh out now. I'm going to copy that up to the normals as well.
can do in this next second part now, I wonder? Ooh, some Bartok pits. sounding here. Really rich basses. Let's take those down a bit. Chelly as well. on these harmonics just to give it even more colour. Duplicating this up again, just making it as rich sounding, blurring the lines a little bit, using the more standard uh, settings, big ensemble stuff. I'm just going to uh, merge those two parts together, and I'm just going to these the 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 in between bits, so the bits, the second violins and the violas, just deleting their automation, and now I'm just going to re-record that. <laughs> So they're playing tremolando, a bit of life. Okay, um, let's listen to that back. And thanks very much uh, for watching this with me. And uh, next time we'll be looking at symphonic strings and going into maybe a little bit more detail of uh, how I approach it. <laughs>